All right, welcome back everyone to the FPL script. This is season one, episode nine, otherwise the season finale of the 22-23 FPL season. It's a pleasure to be joined by FPL Mayor, who will be who will be calling Brad over the course of the show. I'm obviously joined by my usual co-host JD, and I'm your usual co-host Fran as well. We've rounded out, of course, probably a great season for, for Brad here, who's finished MD2, XG data 7, and overall data 6. Uh, JD, maybe you'd like to also explain how overall data came about through review. Yeah, so glad to have Brad on the show with us today. Um, so FPL Review put out a tweet explaining how he has gone about weighing up different data sources. So it's fairly arbitrary. It's meant to include everything in such as like, you know, FPL points as well, because what normally happens is when we are playing based on underlying stats and uh, predictive uh, points, we just end up with EV and XG. So what he has done is he has tried to also give justice to the fact that, you know, outcome does matter at the end of the day for, you know, people playing FPL. So he has kind of used 38% on X-Mins, the EV-based X-Mins, 23% on actual minutes-based EV, and then 23% on XG data and 16% on FPL points. So it's basically spread out between hindsight and foresight which does make sense because um, you do have to value outcome as well as predictive ability at the end of the day. Uh, perfect. Would you would you like to probably give us a bit of detail into your FPL history, Brad? Yeah, so thanks for having me on, both of you, firstly. Um, yeah, so like most, I probably started with like a mate's league. This was probably four, five, six years ago. I didn't have a clue what I was doing, to be honest. So I've got some pretty dodgy ranks. But then the last season or two, probably two or three seasons, I've started to take it a bit more seriously. And yeah, over the last kind of two years, I've been getting more into the analytics side of things and the data side, and it's been fun to learn. Yeah. Sounds good. I mean, I think you, you obviously encapsulated what many would consider perfect season. So we thought it would be good given that we actually sort of analyzed you game week, game week to game week to, to probably run through from the start of the season general some strategy points and, and even some transfer points that we we thought would be interesting to look forward to in next season whether that kind of strategy is something that you adopted over the course of the season whether things changed and you know what you'd like to take going forward to next season as well i think starting off with game week one one oh, thing hang on, hang on. Oh, sorry. Uh, before that i think it's uh, very important to mention that uh, Brad has already achieved what what we kind of consider to be the holy grail, where he has actually gotten into top 5k with negative luck, yeah. with negative variance, which is an absolutely insane achievement. Um, what was it like? Point one three percent of top 10k managers had negative variance, if I remember correctly. And you know, we'll fact check and uh, put out the actual stats if that's not the case. But it's insanely low percentage that actually do get into top 10k with negative variance. So that's actually some accomplishment. Which means that he could have actually gone gotten a higher rank if he had just gotten neutral luck, well, which is kind of insane to say. And he could have easily finished with let's say something like top one k. I don't know. It's a it's an arbitrary number, but that could have easily been the case with a little bit of luck. Yeah, if only. <laughs> anyway, sorry. I just wanted to get that out because that's like a very important uh, point of you know why why Brad and uh, sorry before also I think we need to get into uh, why you chose FPL Mayor as your uh, Twitter handle. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So basically, the first FPL account I found on Twitter was FPL General. And then I was like, okay, I need to make a separate account. So I'll do something similar. So went with Maya and then basically Googled a picture, Googled the word Maya in Google Images. All the pictures were pretty boring. So I found uh, Quimby and just went with that, basically. Not not too much of an interesting story. I don't really have that much of an affiliation to the Simpsons, but there we go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Makes sense. Sorry, Brian, we can go ahead with the season two highlights. No, absolutely. So, I mean, just start off with game week one. Uh, this is where a lot of people have different strategic points. Some people were very against, I think, owning Bailey, for example, who probably wasn't seen as someone who was nailed preseason wise but you you chose to go with a draft that had ward and iverson which left you money in the bank but also incorporated someone like bailey who some people saw as you know someone who could be an enabler but someone who could also vastly overachieve really his or pricing yeah so kind of in general i'm about as safe a manager as it gets so whenever 
I, I will always kind of try to leave my options as open as possible. That's why I left a bit of money in the bank for my first team, just so I could react to to anything that might come up if I needed to, for example, move up one of the goalkeepers to a 4.5 goalkeeper or any other option, essentially. Uh, I also made the team so that I was not booking in any transfers at all. Um, again, just so I could be flexible to move to absolutely anything that that happened because I suppose the start of the season is where we have the least information on all teams, players, lineups, everything. So basically, I just want to be as flexible as possible. And that's the, that's the reason for that, essentially. Would you also say that because you didn't book in any transfers for game week two, and ultimately you had to burn a transfer in game week two, going back to it, would you change your approach somewhat? Because I know that game week two, free, uh, burning a transfer is not in your hands. It just turned out to be the case that you didn't need to make a transfer. But otherwise, do you think that burning an NFT beforehand, like when you think about it beforehand, would, is a wise strategy? Or is that something you are just reacting to? Yeah, well, I, I did think about that because obviously burning a free transfer is not ideal. And yeah. I probably left a move on the table that I could have made. But when it came to my, my second wild card. I played it exactly the same way, whereby I didn't want to make, I didn't want to make any planned transfers, and that had kind of the opposite effect. That actually went really well. So it's it's tough to draw a decision from from either of them. One worked and one didn't. So I I'd, I'd probably still take the flexible approach next time. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. Moving on to the captaincy call that kind of haunted many of us, which is Salah over Holland in game weeks four, five, six, and nine. Uh, looking back, do you think that there was a point in time where he, all of us could have maybe thought, oh, this is getting out of hand? And, you know, I'm assuming you were one of those managers who also thought that Holland's x mens were lower on the lower side compared to Salah, who was just 90 minute man every single week. So looking back, on it do you think that that's an approach that you could maybe change moving ahead yeah for sure i mean one of the kind of strategies i go by again is trying to optimize for kind of long term rather than just the weakness in front of me or whatever kind of short sample it is and that often leads me to picking the most safe option i mean we'll talk later how i picked the wrong brighton defender but yeah, I also basically try to go for the most safe option possible, um, especially in the early game weeks as well, whereby you don't want a player that's not going to play. And that often leads me to, yeah, realising X minutes too slowly. But then I suppose it is, that's that's one outcome of it. And the other outcome, it, it, it could have gone quite easily the other way, I suppose. It's... um. It's a tough one to judge, but yeah, I, I think we were all probably a bit slow on that. Yeah. Yeah, and also, uh, just for any listeners uh, who might think that I'm trying to advocate for a reactionary approach, it's, it's not that. It's just that it is one of these instances where it went wrong every single time. And so when do you realize that it's going wrong and then you stop the rot? Because for me, I was, I'm not going to say being stubborn, but just trusting EV, trusting minutes. And trusting the fact that my rate of updating his x mins was correct. Which in hindsight was not the case because his x mins should have bumped up, been, been bumped up to 90 based on outcome. But again, as you said, it's not that it's it's not the case. It could have easily been the case that he would have been benched one of those weeks. So not necessary that we need to change our complete strategy for x means based on that, but maybe there is a lesson that, you know, once uh, you see a freak of nature <laughs> playing in the Premier League, you can maybe update a bit quicker. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think, yeah, like, like you say, we were, all, we were all a bit slow to it and I was, yeah, guilty of being one of the slowest. <laughs> That's fair enough. I think one thing you weren't really slow on was owning a Solanke for, for most of his holes this season. And, and Solanke yeah. was actually someone that a lot of people didn't really back as a pick because you're obviously picking effectively a talisman from what many people perceived as as a much weaker team. Was there any reason that you were open to, to going for Solanke at that point in time? Yeah, again, it's, it's, it's similar reasons, to be honest. Like, he's 
as safe a pick as it gets in that he was always going to start. He was on penalties. He would always usually play 90 minutes. And again, he was very much the cheapest option of the forwards that had all of those things. So it meant it was a safe pick, but also left me flexible in other other areas, meaning I could spend my money in the midfield, which, yeah, that, that's it. that seemed a safe play to me. Fair enough. And actually, because obviously of the, the Queen's death, probably not much to, to really take away from in terms of your initial wild card. So I, I assume you you, di- you did your transfers for Brighton, got surprised by the news, had to react effectively with that Game Week 8 wild card. And something that came out of it was that you did go for triple Newcastle defense, which you know was a recurring theme later on in the season as well. Um, but was there any reason that you were totally open to triple Newcastle defense? Because at, at the same time, I think people generally are, are very unhappy to, let's say, own triple up of a defense, mostly because it's hard watching um, your defense try to keep a clean sheet when you have three of them. But, you know, it, it does show, obviously, that you're very keen on, let's say, backing any ideas that review would, would propose that most people sidestep from. Yeah, I'm not really, I, 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 there's not really a situation where I'd ever kind of discard a, a triple up anywhere, really. Just, to, I, I'm not really kind of one for one for hedging in any kind of way if if the data is kind of showing the right things then i'll essentially go for it and luckily that that decision actually served me pretty well for for most of the early part okay yeah. that makes sense i think the the wild card was pretty stable for you because there, there weren't really too too many moves to make but you did manage to go from Solanke to wilson at, at game week 14. I'm, I'm not sure if at that time wilson was necessarily uh, a high X men's pick, but, but was there any specific reason to, to going for Wilson at that point in time, or was that just by circumstance, really? I think again, it was a situation where I planned pretty well from the wild card, meaning that I didn't really leave myself with many moves, so I could afford that kind of luxury move as such. Which yeah, I mean, it turned out to be absolutely incredible, but yeah, I think it was more that. I'd planned well enough. I mean, most people weren't in the situation to be able to do to, be, to do that sort of transfer. They had other other things going on, but I think that's where the long term planning from the wild card helped me quite a lot, really. But and also on the point of you know normal, you said that you are as safe as managers come, but in that in the case of hedging with triple Newcastle defense, I think that's one of the most like you're f- forcing outcome variability on your team in a sense because you either get 18 points or you get six points. So it's like in a way you are actually hedging quite heavily onto one team, but that actually left you later on in the season with fewer decisions to make, which led you to this kind of a luxury transfer. Am I right in kind of making that conclusion? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, and. Yeah. I mean, we'll talk a bit later on, but it also goes completely the wrong way in that once I'm on a triple up, I'll most likely be too stubborn to move off of it for another player in that team. So, yeah, I mean, it doesn't necessarily always work out, but yeah, essentially. That's yeah, but a... true. But also on the other hand, it didn't cost you much in MD and XG and it led to you having worse luck in a, in a way because like Wilson's 24 points is such a variance uh, laden event that that actually must have contributed quite heavily to you getting a uh, negative variance right yeah well yeah, yeah yeah makes sense makes sense okay so next decision we're kind of looking at is Salah to KDB captain which actually was in hindsight a 16 point loss because Salah scored quite heavily in that week and um, KDB got I think an assist or something like that. It was just a, quite a poor week for KDB. So what was your thought process behind that kind of move? Because we've seen throughout your season that you are quite keen on owning Salah as, you know, someone that subscribes to analytics. That doesn't surprise me. But, you know, why did you veer away from Salah for that particular duration? Yeah, I think I think it was actually rather similar to the, to the Wilson move in that I often find myself in situations where I don't really have much of a move. So, uh, I mean, that move didn't re- probably need to be made, but I, I can't actually remember, but I most likely had two transfers, meaning that I had to make a move. So I was looking at kind of any marginal gains as such, and I thought that was one. 
yeah, I think for context, that was a week Haaland was benched as well. So yeah, potentially, yeah. yeah, you would have seen maybe ADB would have been an optimal captain in that week, which I think review also suggested the same because I took a hit to, to KDB myself in that week, uh, if I had to be honest. If we move on towards game week 17 now, given the World Cup break, we had the chance to potentially go Ederson and Kepa or Ederson and Leno, at least most people who didn't exclude Ederson um, and weren't idiots like myself. So you went with Leno actually in, in your team. And I, I think one of the questions that we probably wanted to ask initially was just, you know, with Kepa obviously coming back into the team potentially, which was the rumor, and a lot of people did jump at the opportunity of that. But was there any reason why you, you went for Leno instead? Yeah, so it, it was it was partly because I wanted the outfield players from Chelsea. I wanted three outfield players. I thought that the upside was much more there with James Cutrella. And also, again, as I kind of I tend to play X minutes as safe as it gets. I mean, I think on the pie chart, it was, I'm literally, that section was full. I the, I, I didn't really trust Kepa's X minutes at that point yet. So they're the two main reasons for that. Yeah. So uh, another reason why we looked at that decision in particular is because Fulham had pretty bad XGC per 90, if I remember correctly, at that point in the season already. So I know that, you know, once you look at EV, you stop looking at one particular metric because you know that EV uh, considers all of these metrics and you don't need to like sift through every single one of them. Like, oh, is he going to make a lot of saves or, you know, is he going to probably save a penalty if he's good at saving penalties or something like that. But was it simply a case of, okay, the EV says that Leno is may be equivalent to Kepa and then I can own Chelsea players without sacrificing EV or did you give it a thought that oh their XGC is quite bad so should I maybe use a different strategy there? Nah to be honest I didn't mainly because I wanted to fit as many double game week players in as possible and I'll, I'll, I'll that's kind of I'll always do that really and that was a way to do it. I didn't obviously want any at that point any Fulham Outfield players apart yeah. from the, Mitrovic. the standard ones, yeah, like Mitrovic yeah. and probably Andreas at that time. Yeah. And it meant I could fit an extra double game week player into the team while still having three Chelsea players. Interesting. Yeah. And I think one move that we actually looked at, given that you are such a safe X Men's player, was uh, James to Athbiqueta in game week 19. I mean, how, how do you feel about that move? Because just for context as well, of course, James is someone who gets injured often, and he happened to do so this season. This was, of course, a Chelsea double. But there were some other picks at the time, like United picks, um, such as Shaw, even Trent potentially, but potentially you, you couldn't have gone for Trent given that you owned Ederson, and that probably closed you off. Yeah, so I remember, so on that wild card, me and Flapjack actually had the same, exact yeah. same team. Yeah. So I was talking to him quite a bit, and all week we were just going to do James to Shaw. All week, we're just going to James for sure, and that would have been the right move in hindsight. But we kind of both talked in, talked each other in to just grabbing another double game week player because it obviously it looked like Spilicueta was going to start both games probably. So we actually thought that was pretty safe, being that we both had we had two free transfers, so we could quite easily just move to shore straight after. So we were just grabbing an extra fixture, and then we could move straight to shore. That was. That was the thought process behind that. In hindsight, it did go quite wrong, but I think I'll always choose an extra fixture if if I if I can get one. Yeah, I I, I don't doubt that you know the the process of choosing double game weaker will always you know have precedence over maybe a single game weaker even if they have a great fixture. But I think the the point here that we are trying to understand is. Did you have enough confidence that as is going to play twice given his age and you know, a number of factors at Chelsea that were going on at the time. Oh, I, I pretty much did think he'd both start. He started both okay. games. Yeah, yeah. Just that's fair enough. Fair enough. I didn't really see any other options that they had at that point. Obviously, later in the season, or um, I don't even know if it was still the case at that point, but players like Loftus-Cheek were playing out there. But at that point in the season, it didn't really seem like that was an option. So, yeah, I, I yeah, pretty much trusted that he'd play both games. Yeah. This is a situation where if, if I'd have just had one transfer, I probably would have just gone to shore regardless. But it was because I had that extra move where 
I thought, okay, I can just go straight to Shaw the week after. So I think that that played a part in it as well. Yeah, so based on um, what the game weeks that we've reviewed so far, it looks like every single time you had a disposable free transfer, it's actually cost you points, but not necessarily cost you MD and XG, which uh, again does contribute to negative variance uh, by a lot. The next decision we were looking at is the a decision that all three of us made, uh, which was going Martinelli to Odegaard once Trossard was uh, the Trossard transfer to Arsenal took place. So again, you know, it's it's fully understanding the fact that he was a direct competition to Martinelli, and we did expect Martinelli's min- minutes to reduce. Do you think that we went? We were too cautious with that, and you know, maybe sh- we should have waited for it to actually materialize before making that move. Well, yeah, so I, I I wasn't actually keen on that move at all. Mm. It, uh, I mean, I, I know a lot of people moved the week before. Um, I wasn't keen then, and I wasn't actually keen the week I made it either. I didn't, I thought people were being a bit too hasty with Martinelli mm. losing minutes. But it, it, again, this was a situation where I had no other move and I had two free transfers. So. I had to do something. Uh, essentially, quite a lot of the decisions that we've talked about have come where I didn't really have many other moves to do. Um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And also, you know, I have a macro question because we've spoken, I think, a lot about adjusting expectations uh, for minutes, which is throughout this season, do you think that your process of estimating minutes has changed based on, you know, anecdotal evidence or empirical evidence throughout the season? Yeah, that's a good question. I think Haaland alone has had an impact on on that. Well, I suppose Pep's, Pep's a whole different situation on yeah. that couple of minutes. But I think, yeah, I, I, I tend, from the beginning of the season, I would just tend to play it incredibly safe. And I don't really feel like I've changed in that. And I think the most recent wildcard shows that as well. And actually the decisions after that. I think that I will stick to the safest X minutes going and uh, uh, yeah, that's something I probably need to actually look at for going forward because I think I play uh, quite too safe at times. Yeah, we actually pulled up your uh, risk, uh, relative change versus risk percentage graph from FPL Optimized and it shows that the two times you've actually crossed the 50% risk percentage is in game week 38 which is when you bet against Kane, Trent, uh, which were massively owned by, you know, the field. And the second one is game week 19. So if uh, FPL optimized is considering 50% to be a kind of threshold where you crossing 50% means that you took sizable risk against the field, uh, it does kind of seem to portray the fact that you were playing safe, but also, you know, playing sensibly, which is what matters at the end of the day, because being reckless and Taking risk most often leads to you know even worse outcomes. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and yeah, there's been plenty of situations where it has gone, it has gone the right way, and it has gone well. Which, yeah, yeah I mean, we'll talk about it in a second. But the the next wild card, it went incredibly well in that situation. It's just there's always going to be times when it goes against you at the same time. Makes sense. I guess I had another question as well. So. I mean, just in terms of how you interpret how nailed someone is, is there any kind of process that you you have in, into looking at that? Do you do you look at predicted lineups by certain people or certain aspects of the community? For example, uh, Emma, who, for example, shows predicted lineups. Do you, do you pay attention to things like that? Or how do you go about, let's say, assessing whether a player is nailed beyond the hive mind expense and review? Yeah, I, 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 I tend to take more of a personal approach to it rather than looking at what others are predicting apart from the likes of Luke who I couldn't do better than that so but for most situations I tend to do my own kind of research on it whereby I'll look at the previous minutes played obviously from a certain sample of games and any reasoning why that would change and that, that that's 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 all there is to it really that's all i really look at but i, I don't tend to look at the kind of yeah hive mind picks or pre- other predictions i tend to go 
off of what I see personally. Yeah. So sorry, uh, just before we move on, uh, the hive mind. The problem with hive mind is also the fact that it is only done for the top clubs, and more often than not, we end up having to look for players. Like for example, in game week thirty eight, Demarai Gray was a great option because he was all of a sudden on penalties and supposedly going to play through the middle because the weightage that is assigned to penalties behind the scenes. So we have no idea if FPL review is quick on updating those those percentage i suppose he is I'm, I'm assuming he is because you know he is always on top of things but there could be a case where even in the review you might think oh this isn't fair to the circumstances and maybe you want to increase the ev in your mental model i suppose that's an yeah. interesting point actually because i spoke to a peel critic the other day and he was telling me about his decision to go for buendia on the game week 27 wild card and Mm. He had basically, you know, upped Buendia's minutes and he had to look at his own MD week to week after going for Buendia and that it didn't change whatsoever, even though Buendia was actually playing closer to 80 to 90 minutes of football. But on review, it was effectively 60, 66, that sort of territory. So he felt like, you know, he, he, he might want to look at some sort of hindsight MD source, which was a bit of discourse on Twitter that I thought was quite interesting uh, that you also chimed in, uh, Brad. Yeah, yeah. I also remember talking to him actually when on Wildcard about about that Buendia um, decision. And yet, yeah, as I was kind of saying, it's you get to see the long term effects of it because you're essentially predicting future EV when you're adjusting X mins. Yeah. So, but yeah, it, it would be it would be very interesting to see uh, an actual X mins MD rank as such. Yeah, which is, I think, why um, Review has used 23% weightage to actual bins EV as a means to kind of being fair, in a sense, to people who perhaps didn't get the rub of the green on X means because the hive mind was slow and the players themselves were quick enough to update the X means themselves. Yeah, agreed. I don't know. I don't know if you know, was that something that's changed this year? the actual minutes played being 23% on the... Yeah, it's, a, it's actually interesting. So uh, we had a conversation in the Discord server uh, about this and in the analytics Discord server, and we kind of suggested to review that maybe it's fair that you have both ranks on display, uh, as in one that is fully being evaluated on x means and one that is being fully evaluated on minutes, because there might be someone who is massively suffering as a result of the hive mind being too slow. And there are maybe people who are getting wrongly rewarded because, you know, they didn't catch up to the reality of the situation, but the x means keeps boosting their MD unnecessarily sometimes. And those yeah. are rare cases, obviously. Majority of the people do fall in like the, within one sigma of, of the normal distribution of where you expect players to lie. But there are a lot of outliers and it's just a fun thing to look at. You know, you can look at the differences between your X min EV and your mince EV, and then for you, it's maybe a self reflection exercise to understand if you can get better at predicting minutes of certain players. Yeah, it's a good judge of of your, I suppose, skill. When yes, evaluating X min this year. All right, perfect. Well, going back on track to your season. So in game week twenty five, you actually took the only hit of your season, which was a multi transfer that allowed you to get. Sarabia, Salah, Trent, and, and Darwin effectively all, all on that week. Was there any reason why you might have skirted over what I imagine review would have suggested, which, which was probably double Liverpool defense? Or was the hit actually on the cards for you? Uh, yeah, well, no, it was essentially, yeah, because I just trusted Darwin's X minutes at that point. And as we kind of know, when he plays, he's an XG monster. Ooh. So... Yeah. Uh, you didn't really have to boost his minutes by much on review to to make that work. And I thought that was worth it, essentially, yeah. I think the judgment call was with Sarabia, if I'm not wrong, right? Because there were some doubts as to if he's going to start in both games. He did end up starting in both games. And I suppose that was a big win for you in terms of gauging his uh, expense or propensity to start. Yeah, I didn't really... I, I didn't really agree with the fact he wouldn't start both games, basically. Sure. I didn't see any reason why he wouldn't start both games, so I was quite happy to go with it. Okay, and given that it was your only hit of the season, was it more just 
the importance, I guess, of, of Darwin in, in that week for you that, that made you take that hit? And is there any reason looking back maybe why you would have avoided hits in, in other double game weeks later on in the season? Yeah, it, it, it pretty much was like you said. It was that I basically really wanted Darwin. I thought he would do incredibly well if he got the minutes. Um, in terms of not taking hits in other double game weeks, the, the, well, the main reason for that is I will try to plan for double game weeks as best I can, as in as far in advance as possible. And I feel like in this season, I did that pretty well. There wasn't that many double game weeks that were brung upon me where I wasn't that planned for. But I suppose besides besides that one, as I had to take a hit to get a lot of Liverpool players. But in general, I tend to plan, yeah, quite far in advance for them. Um, which might not be necessarily the greatest move, I guess, because I'm sacrificing some probably points and certainly some EV in the short term. So if I'm wildcard in, I don't know, five or six game weeks before a double, I'll absolutely stack up on them doubles. And yeah, I mean, like the Newcastle, triple Newcastle, I'm essentially taking slight EV hits up until that double game week but I'd rather be prepared for that double game week I was thinking about how doing that you know using that kind of strategy also paid off in a sense where for example Newcastle kept a clean sheet against Man United in the double and that was a big surprise because they were expected to probably concede there and then keep a clean sheet in the next in the other game and they considered in the other game but i understand where brad is coming from in that it's difficult to gauge how much ev loss it is but you also want to stack up on the double so if it's a it's a very minor so oh, sorry yeah that's actually an interesting uh, segue which is uh is there a threshold that you use like okay i'm okay to take a ev loss of one from maybe the most optimal path suggested by review but this suits me better because i can stack up on more players that have double gaming or something similar yeah, not so much a threshold, but I suppose it, it ties into the wild card in 27, where yeah, my wild card was far from the review optimal team at that point. And that was mainly because I wanted to set it up long term again. So the, 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 the double game, it was 29, right? So there was players that had good 27 and 28 fixtures that review was suggesting, but I wanted to plan for 29 instead. So no, no, not a threshold as such in EV terms. But yeah, I'll definitely always plan for the doubles as opposed to short-term gains, basically. Yeah, and one of those decisions was while, while cutting in 27 instead of 26, which meant that you already had the information that Sanchez was no longer number one for Brighton. Was that something that led you to go with Dunk because he was the safest option at the time and discounting all the Estupinian to Australia stuff, which of course was a very trivial thing and it didn't it didn't impact him in any way. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, if I my plan was to work hard in twenty six, I can't remember what the piece of information was that stopped that, but there was a few people that didn't end up doing it, but. I, I, I certainly would have gone for Sanchez in 26. My my oh. draft had Sanchez in it. So I suppose that was big slice of luck, certainly MD-wise. But yeah, that was the main reasoning for Dunk, yeah, over Estupinan, which in actual points obviously went horribly wrong. But that, that that's a situation where I will pretty much always play the safest option, but it doesn't always it doesn't always doesn't always work out for me. Uh, makes sense uh, and also you actually went for james on on that wild card too so given that you were actually at, at that point in the season still chasing because of the ne negative variance that you had suffered early on was there any thought to to going for james just to kind of have a little bit of outcome variability free risk effectively because many people seemed like they wanted to go for chillwell although james actually had more ev on on, on review for example yeah and again i think it was where i'd kind of taken a stance on on his X minutes as well. I suppose I swear, where review has almost expected injury into their into their numbers as well. Yeah, I, which is uh, expressed as availability percentage. So you can boost his minutes to 90, but it's still a fraction of 90 that it would consider. Uh, sorry for people that don't. Yeah, exactly. And I don't always trust that part of it. So 
if there's a injury prone player, I'll tend to boost them a little bit, which in this case completely backfired. But yeah, that's that 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 was my thinking going James over Chilwell. And you actually mentioned, of course, that you had planned ahead for Game Week 29 with your Game Week 27 wildcard, which was interesting to me because a lot of people actually were suggested with a, a huge hit, effectively, you know, to go to Salah, Fernandez, Shaw, all at once. And you had a pretty measured approach, I would say. You went for Fernandez, who was a priority target, someone that actually, as we know, of course, with hindsight now, was effectively a keeper until the end of the season. But you decided to delay Salah because you had Madison in your team as well. Is is that just your planning ahead from, from 27, effectively? And do you think there was any reason as well why you might have sidestepped Shaw, for example, on that week as well? Yeah, not 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 really. When I did the 27 wildcard, the planned kind of moves were that it involved Shaw in 29. Um, it so happened that that didn't work out in the end and I ended up, yeah, making different moves. But there was no reason to ignore Shaw. I would have absolutely gone for Shaw if that was the most, uh, if that worked. I probably left myself in a position where I could get rid of Kane earlier, which a lot of people obviously didn't want to do. But I was quite happy to do that. And that's all there, all there was to it, really. That makes sense. And actually going back to, I mean, we, we looked at your season as well. Kane was someone that you owned for two weeks and it was effectively just those two weeks, 27, 28. And then you binned him off for Solanke in, in 29. I mean, is, was there any reason why you opted uh, for no Kane? Potentially, of course, just preferring Salah as well as a pick who, I mean, at the end of the day, this was his fourth worst season FPL, still an amazing season overall. And this, I think Kane, this being his best Kane season. Kane right? Kane exactly. Kane had Bournemouth on, on yeah. 30. So that's obviously yeah. by going Solanke, you're sort of foregoing that. Uh, and I think a lot of people were scared about that, potentially because Kane was seen as a captaincy option too, if if we didn't get Haaland recovering in time or or, or whatever. Yeah, no, there, there wasn't any major reason for ignoring Kane for most of the season, if I'm honest. It was kind of like you say, I'd always, for the most part, preferred Salah, Salah and Haaland, obviously. And then if it was ever going to spend more money, <clears throat> I didn't really want to do it in the forward spots. I wanted to be doing that in the midfield slots for players like Fernandez and whoever else. I wanted a stronger midfield rather than a stronger forward line. And that, that that's, that's the main reason. You know, and also, um, as Fran pointed out, you know, with, with Kane, people obviously have... This season has been incredible for Kane. And it turns out that his best season coincided with Salah's fourth best season. And even then, Salah outscored him purely because... He had uh, penalties and, uh, and sorry, he's a midfielder. He scores more points and, you know, he had more uh, chances of clean sheet points as well. Yeah, exactly. And that's that. Yeah, essentially, that's why I'd rather I pretty much always rather spend more money in the midfield. There's just more routes to more points, essentially. Yeah, I think overall Kane outscored Salah, if I'm not wrong. But I was talking about like when you owned him, I think you had more success with uh, Salah actually coming good over Kane for the majority of the duration that you owned, owned Salah. Yeah, yeah. And I think, yeah. to be honest, that in actual points, that was a bit lucky, whereby obviously Kane against Bournemouth didn't, yeah, he could he could have yeah. hurt me a lot more in that game, yeah. definitely. Well, I mean, in the end, you also didn't go for Kane on game week 38. So I think the luck sort of went both ways, really. So um, perhaps being. A bit too kind there but that was effectively your season with exception to free hit 32 which uh, i think we, we had all planned of course if you were wild card in gaming 26 27 that was a week where you went with i think actually the the review md suggested free hit and that was triple arsenal mid and going for someone like robertson and trent that sort of double up there was there any reason why you actually ended up with with the arsenal mids and Maybe let's say sidestep Jesus, who I think was hugely popular that week. Yeah, it was, I suppose, yeah, it was less of a reason to sidestep Jesus, but I trusted the Arsenal mids a lot more than Gakpo minutes wise that week. So the, yeah, that was the reason for going Robertson and Trent rather than someone like Gabriel and Gakpo. But yeah, that was, that was. There wasn't really much else to that in terms of uh, I was just trying to fit all of the players with good fixtures 
the ones with five minutes in essentially and yeah I, I didn't really trust Gakpo that was the main reasoning for for that combination yeah and I think you actually went with the three four three so you obviously clearly backed three penalty takers anyways that weren't Jesus included so is there any kind of preference that you have because you, you've also gone for Solanke quite a few times this season effectively th that sort of budget for that has as, as you say the perfect intangibles of being a penalty taker as well is that something you prefer let's say compared to a, a budget midfielder at times I think Eze for example was a was a popular option on that week that you you didn't go for even Andreas yeah yeah exactly that and uh, and yeah like I was mentioning before I'd always rather spend more money on premium or even just more expensive midfielders than I would forwards just because of the the, the extra point for a goal, the clean sheet, all, all of those reasons I'd rather spend more money in the midfield slots. And also another week where maybe, you know, there was not much to think about because it was a one-off week was perhaps game week 38 where you went for Jesus over Kane. And you essentially bet against uh, Kane as well as Trent Alexander Arnold. So again, is that just a case of okay, I can only make this move because there are limited number of free transfers, and I'm just going to follow the MD route for gaming 38? Or uh, did you have some other kind of thought process behind that? Not really. There wasn't really much thought behind that. That was actually a week where real life actually got involved a little bit. I didn't have the oh. I wasn't able to actually necessarily see all of the leaks in 38. The, if I'd gone Kane, the other side of that move would have been probably a little bit more risky about seeing leaks. So um, it seemed like, yeah, the Jesus was a bit more a bit more safe, basically, which is weird to say because Kane's about as safe as it gets. <laughs> yeah, we found the... Chink in FPL Mayors is uh, skill armor, which is not being available for uh, FPL, for lineup leaks, which is yeah. um, the best skill you need in FPL, I guess. Yeah, I did. I, well, so I did manage to see that the, the Haaland wasn't or was supposedly not starting yet. So yeah. I, I got that part of it, but that, that was about as far as it got. And that actually, yeah, I. I went for Salah captain instead of if I'd have because would am I right in saying there was a leak saying that Rashford was definitely starting? Yeah, yeah, there was the full eleven was leaked well, well in advance. Yeah, yeah, I mean uh, that was probably there's every chance I would have captain Rashford if I'd seen that. To be honest, oh, that's interesting because I think that is exactly what led a lot of people to captain Rashford because. Out of the three options that you had, Kane, Salah and uh, Rashford, Rashford was the only one who was confirmed to start well before the deadline. And with the other two, you just had to go with historical data that why would they get benched all of a sudden? Like You just had to trust the managers to not make weird decisions in Game Week 38. Like That was the only kind of risk with Kane and Salah. But, you know, again, uh, no one expected such... I mean, okay, I won't say no one expected it, but uh, it's unfair that it was such a wild swing in outcome because, you know, Rashford had decent chances and Kane, I think, uh, throughout the season was the most overperforming player in terms of his XG. I think he had plus 8.3 XG uh, overperformance if you look at fbref.com, uh, mm. which uses the Opta data model. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Game Week 38 is always just an absolute minefield for... Yeah minutes as well so if yeah if i'd have seen that rashford was starting i would have most likely captained him i think yeah yeah i think rashford actually was the deadline md captain if i recall so yes yeah yeah he makes was complete the, sense. Uh, because again he, his minutes were updated and Kane's were already at 85 because no one has touched Kane's minutes throughout the season i think yeah I mean, there's yeah. no reason to do that so uh, once you bumped up Rashford's mince to 85, he was the clear-cut first choice uh, in pure MD terms. Yeah, and at maybe the end of the day, was... Sal and Rashford both had fantastic expected goal involvement. Maybe that's the reason I didn't get MD1. Oh, that's actually, yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe. that's how, By how many points did you miss out on one? Uh, no, it, it wasn't that close, I don't think. Okay, okay. Shout out to uh, FPL's uh, Space Fund, by the way, who yeah. uh, secured MD1 rank and... Uh, it, it was the final scan that kind of cemented your number two spot, right? Because I saw you tweet quite a while in advance that you had number two and 
uh, JC at number one, but uh, review took maybe another day to kind of finalize that. Yeah, yeah, J- J- JC was JC was clear to be fair. Uh, yeah, fine, fine. fine. He, he was there a couple weeks before as well. I, I don't think there was something something uh, quite mad that about to happen for me or anyone else to be able to catch him. Yeah. Yeah, but the sad thing about that is nothing bad can happen once the deadline is gone because it won't matter. It won't matter with EV anyway. So I suppose once the deadline was done, you know, you already knew who was going to win uh, yeah. win out on MD. Yeah, yeah fair enough. So uh, I guess that's the review of uh, Brad's FPL season, which was, again, uh, a fantastic season. One of the best, you know, we've seen this season in terms of underlying stats, actual ranks. Um, before we go, you know, one more thing I wanted to ask was as a West Ham fan, uh, you guys are in the Europa Conference League final. So how are you feeling about that? Very much looking forward to that. Absolutely buzzing. To be fair, it's been, well, obviously not in my lifetime since we've been a, in a European final. So that's going to just be, that's going to be quite something. And I back us to win as well. Yeah, do, do you think that it has helped uh, you know, keeping David Moyes for the whole season because, you know, there were obvious rumours that maybe he was going to get replaced halfway through. But as we've seen, he has kind of maintained West Ham's underlying stats as well in terms of, you know, his chance creation and uh, I suppose chance uh, con- concession as well. But uh, do you think that has helped keeping him and then uh, going on a cup run like this? Yeah, uh, to be honest, I don't, I don't ever think the underlying numbers were that bad. No, they were. No, they weren't at all. They were really yeah, good. Never, never, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you you'd hope that the club see that, <laughs> whether they do or not. Who knows? But yeah, I, uh, I mean, I'm glad we kept in. I was never in the camp that was wanting him desperately out. If if there was a better option that was lined up, then then fine. But um, that that's not really the West Ham way of late to have a good successor lined up like Brighton do. <laughs> yeah, that's the ideal model we all want our clubs to follow, mm-hmm. I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> okay, actually, well, I do have one last question before we probably sign off. But it's just be- because you ha- had such negative variants, maybe heading towards World Cup specifically, I remember you had pretty much a mo- monumentous comeback. W- was there any reason why you, you stuck with review or, or mentally how did you even approach that? Because I imagine a lot of managers, you know, if they are struggling it's very hard to think that your your let's say game week um process is is working out and 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 to actually stay you know resolved with with that was was there any reason why you, you stuck so staunchly to it i think that's where kind of reviews season review can help in that sense not just looking at obviously md rank or ev or anything like that cuz you you can still do badly with that but looking at xg rank is quite important in that sense i found whereby that was backing up confirming decisions i was making because my xg rank was always quite high so that that is kind of partly the reason why i was fairly happy even with the negative variants that i was doing relatively well and also we have to mention that one of i think one more source of maybe not getting as much positive variance as a finish like yours would have is probably scoring low on the lower side with captaincy because you scored 608 points in captaincy which is pretty much on the lower side of maybe the median score uh, of captaincy in the top 10k so again it's a very hindsight take to just say oh you could do better with it but is there something that you think that with foresight you could improve in terms of maybe you know uh, uh, except for Holland, of course, and I suppose that is a big chunk of, mm. you know, the the delta. Yeah, I mean, I haven't actually, I, I knew that my captain points were pretty low, but I haven't actually looked into some of the decisions that I made besides Holland. I don't recall any decisions that were that bad apart from Holland Salah ones. So I might have to have a look back on that, but yeah. Like we talked about earlier, the the kind of adjusting to to Haaland quicker would well, I think I think is probably most of the reason. 
Yeah, so hopefully whenever Mbappe comes to the Premier League, we won't take as long to adjust his ex-mates. <laughs> and if he's not a Man United. Oh, my goodness. I don't even mention it. I, I can't go through this. So yeah, that's not happening. <laughs> we have a little bit uh, of the part left where we'll quickly go over our own season reviews as well, Fran and I. But um, i just like to thank Brad for coming on the pod today and you know it was lovely talking to you about you know an exceptional fantasy season no thanks for having me thanks for having me yeah well um equal to what jd said thank you so much for coming on brad no thanks for having me